Um, and there are two main lines that I've been looking at when addressing these issues. One is ICT as a tool to advance human rights or social change, um, which was the sort of first generation of issues. Uh, and the second uh, line of work has been protection of human rights in the digital era, so protection of, of human rights online, so to speak. Um, and it's my, it's my impression that we're actually right now gaining a new momentum on these issues. I just uh, I defended my PhD uh, exactly two months ago in uh, Copenhagen, 27th of January. And, um, <laughs> and in the final phase of that work from last summer more or less until I submitted it um, in, in the fall, I couldn't believe how much was happening. It was like I had this file in my, um, in my inbox called Recent Policy, and it was just, I would just move stuff there all the time that I had to update my thesis with. Then there was an OECD meeting, then there was a Human Rights Council with Frank Leroux's report. Then there was uh, the G8 internet meeting in Paris, et cetera, et cetera. Topics just kept popping up in a lot of policy spaces on these issues. Um, and what I'll try to address today is we're basically talking about two issues here, right? And, and your working group have been as well. There is something called human rights and there is something that we call for simplicity the internet or ICT more broadly. And there are a lot of challenges related to either of the two. Uh, and I'll try to just address a few of them and then um, point to some, some next steps things we could do to move this agenda forward. <clears throat> okay. So, Isabella and Matthias emailed me these three overall questions about a week ago. Um, and I just gave my own sort of initial, you know, from the top of my head response to either of them. So it was fun to hear today what you actually came up with in the end and when you summarized all the debates you had. Um, so does the internet fundamentally change how human rights are protected? In principle, no. In concrete cases, yes, they do. And what can the internet or more broadly ICT contribute to the implementation? Well. It can contribute many things, but to sum it up a bit, it provides new spaces and means of enjoying certain rights, but also new means of violations. And the third overall theme, can human rights serve as a value basis for global internet governance? Indeed it can, I believe so. Um, and again, quite simply put, by using human rights standards as the normative basis for designing and evaluating internet governance mechanisms and practices. Um, some of these issues, uh, some of us in this room were discussing back also in 2003, 2005 during the, the UN World Summit on the Information Society uh, and that debate has continued into the Internet Governance Forum and at that time I was very impressed by the German um, civil society group and the way that people were able to mobilize around these issues and I must say today I'm very impressed that you have such a large group of people that have been working on these issues for three months. I don't think in, in my professional life with these issues I've ever come across such a large group that for such an intensive period of time have actually tried to tackle some very difficult issues. And I'm very, uh, I'm very excited that a report will come out of it as well. Okay, <clears throat> one of the things that my evaluators asked me uh, at, the, at my PhD defense was, so what's the state of affairs with this thing, human rights and the internet? Where are we today? I mean, you point out all these challenges, but can you sort of sum up a bit? Uh, and then I made this uh, scheme for them, um, and where I tried to, to pinpoint some of the positive trends and negative trends, and, and, and there are many others, but just to, to give you an idea, so on the positive side, we have numerous empirical examples from around the globe uh, on how ICT is used to enhance human rights, not only freedom of expression and access to information that we always hear about, but freedom of assembly, the right to education, the right to health, the right not to be discriminated against, women's rights, etc. 
Also, we have these issues increasingly addressed at policy level, as I just mentioned before. We have a growing civil society community working on these issues. One example is the Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles uh, that I've also been a little bit involved in. Um, but also more classical social chain cyber rights networks increasingly frame their issues as human rights issues. Um, many of you know um, APC, Association for Progressive Communication, that is a global network of, I don't know, 80 plus organizations, really strong on these issues, came from a social change agenda, and today are really strong on human rights. Um, and just, I think it was yesterday or the, or the day before, they released two new chapters in their Global Information Society Watch report that focus specifically on some of these issues and tries to map um, globally um, issues and actors around human rights and where human rights intersect with other types of rights, such as consumer rights, for instance. We also have a growing human rights awareness amongst the ICT sector, the business sector. There's the global network initiatives. Um, I, was at, I was at a meeting uh, in Stockholm in, um, in November because the Swedish government is taking a lead on some of these issues where Access now um, presented uh, some of their principles, uh, for instance, on human rights by design in, in products and in policies. Um, we have the, the UN John Ruggie guidelines that was adopted last summer and which is the, the strongest statement till date on the, on the um, responsibility of private companies and that are widely endorsed. So that's really, I mean, that's really some, some pretty significant move forwards. But at the same time, we also have numerous empirical examples on how technology is used to censor, to monitor, to retain, to exchange data threatening, uh, in particular, the, the right to privacy. But it is so that the right to privacy underpin a lot of other um, civil and political rights. So if you, if you fear for your privacy, if you fear for your personal freedom, it will limit your, your ability to exercise other rights as well. So it's, it's, it has implications much beyond the right to privacy. We have the, the fact that personal data increasingly is used for commercial uh, purposes uh, in social media platforms and many other platforms and services as well. We have various schemes of self-regulation that I will return to, uh, which affect in particular freedom of information and the rule of law. And I know that in, in this audience, and, and also I, I was listening in on some of the discussions in the collaboratory today, um, my sense is that, that in this audience, self-regulation is, is really a good thing. Um, and I agree that self-regulation is a good thing when it means that someone tries to regulate their own conduct and behavior. But the thing with self-regulation, uh, the way it has been um, applied in, in um, European internet policies is that it's often the regulation of, of some someone of a private company or a private actor on someone else's conduct. And that's sort of, that's a different aspect of self-regulation that I'll return to. That's problematic from a rule of law perspective. Uh, and then there are some really hardcore political nuts, uh, such as limited political will to revise existing intellectual property regulation at global level and to work on global standards for data protection. Many of these issues are not new, but they are, they are evolving and new empirical examples pop up all the time. Okay, then I move on to the, the human rights challenges. There are many. Um, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just run you through a few of them. One is the very general nature of human rights. I mean, that's sort of the seductive force of human rights, but it's also the weakness. I mean, they are... They were formulated many years ago at a very general level um, to, to work across many different contexts and purposes. So there's, there's a huge gap between such a general human rights standard and then a very particular concrete piece of national or regional regulation. Uh, so what we've said for some years now that human rights need to be 
translate it to the concrete context. Yes, they certainly do that, and the, inter the, the, the Charter for Internet Rights and Principles is one example. F Frank LaRue's uh, report on freedom of expression is another example because he makes it very concrete how technology and an established right to freedom of expression and access to information, how they intersect. So those are both pieces that where, where it becomes easier to understand. But still, I mean, even in, 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 a, in a democratic country like Denmark, it's not always easy to, to address national issues in terms of human rights standards. A lot of policymakers don't like that discourse because it moves focus away from the national uh, parliamentary uh, process. And it's not, always, it's not always the best entry point for discussing a certain issue. In many contexts, they are highly politicized also. Um, I discussed recently with some of my colleagues in the, in the privacy field, and they say that they've started to avoid framing the issues that they work for as privacy issues with reference to the whole human rights framework, but they are, mod they, are, they are increasingly arguing in terms of the economic benefits or the security aspects because they, they feel that that gives them some different avenues to actually promote the policy that they want promoted. Whereas there is a, uh, a gut feeling re uh, reaction uh, amongst many if it's uh, immediately referred to as the human right to privacy. Then there are limitations in enforcement. The whole human rights system is born within the UN systems, so it has all the limitations of an international diplomacy. It's built on states' um, willingness to subject themselves to scrutiny by other states. Uh, and of course, a system like that has limitations. It's true that in, that in Europe we also have a European Court of Human Rights, so we have stronger means of, of enforcement, but still the ongoing monitoring and scrutiny of human rights is via treaty body mechanisms, via state reporting, um, that, type, that type of instruments. Then I've put up that there is still, this is increasing, but there is still limited interaction between the, the, the core human rights organizations, such as my own, uh, a national human rights institutions, and there are national human rights institutions in more than 100, 100 countries uh, in the world, and then the ICT community. There are still not that many people that, that, that interlink. There is limited but increasing case law, and there's limited but increasing public awareness. Uh, the ACTA campaign, for instance, that we had recently uh, in Europe, that was, uh, I've heard many refer to that as the first time that the internet went on the streets uh, protesting. I mean, that was, uh, at, at least in Denmark, I know that that, that, was, that was a campaign that really came through on many different levels in, in society. We also have... Um, the McKinnon call, I've called it, <laughs> uh, Rebecca McKinnon's uh, recent book on the consent of the network that you also referred to today, uh, where she basically called for users worldwide to unite and demand their rights. Um, so, so those type of discourses, and she's, she's quite an opinion maker um, uh, via Global Voices and in many circles in the US, so it's not it's not completely uninteresting when a person like her makes that call and goes around advocating that message in many different spaces. Okay, then if I move on to some of the challenges related to the internet. One challenge um, is that it's I mean, what is the internet? The internet is, I mean, it's, it's even stupid to ask that question, right? Because it's conceptually, legally, how can you grasp something as complex as, that, as the ecosystem that the internet represents? And then again, how can we discuss regulation on something we don't really degree, agree upon, where there are so many different dimensions? And, and these questions were actually one of the motivations uh, when I started my research, uh, because I've been negotiating uh, human rights in ICT policy spaces um, for some years, 
And I was so frustrated when I, when I heard um, civil society groups, policy makers, businesses, etc., try to negotiate issues where they, they were just talking about apples and bananas and pears. It was very clear that they came to the issue from such different angle. Um, and the framing, the framing that you make on the issue, of course, point to specific policy agenda, specific policy choices as the natural choice. So I decided that I would try to develop some key framings, some key conceptions of the internet. Um, there are probably many more. I focused on four framings that I thought was dominating uh, in the policy spaces I was participating in. This is the title of my thesis, Framing the Net, How Discourse Shapes uh, Policy. Um, and I used the notion of, of metaphors. So I used some metaphors, meaning some concepts that we use in our everyday life, and then try to apply them to internet discourses, both the, the resource, research discourse, but also the policy discourse. And I'll present the four metaphors just relatively briefly. Each of them is introduced by a quote that referred to one of them. I, I did a lot of interviews, um, so I just put, I just um, picked some examples of people that refer to the internet as any given metaphor. So the first metaphor is internet as a public sphere. Um, we already <laughs> actually heard Matthias say today, the internet is not only a media, it's also a space, or something like that, uh, in my Danish translation at least, that was how I, I took your point. So internet as a public sphere focuses on the internet as a public space where fundamental freedoms prevail. So the focus here is the Plaza Mayor, as Frank Larue has called it, a global space for debate, for conversation, for meeting, for assembling, for sharing opinions. It's a spatial, democratic view on the internet. In the scholarly literature, especially from communication studies and political science, it's reflected in tons of, of uh, research that addresses the internet's potential uh, from a democratic perspective. And a public sphere perspective points to some specific policy issues. So if the internet is a space, who are included? Who are, in, who are included? Who are excluded? How are fundamental freedoms protected in this sphere? And who has the resources to participate? So a certain framing and some, cert and some specific policy issues. The next metaphor I called internet as media. Again, you can find tons of literature addressing the internet as a new media. Uh, and often this literature um, would, would say something like, well, we know that the internet is very different from previous types of media, but nevertheless, when addressing the internet, with, when discussing the internet, notions from, uh, from previous media are used as the point of reference. So within this sphere, whereas in the public sphere, you would talk about conversations, people debating, opinions, democratic life. Here you have discussions or, or um, debates focusing on content, liability, audiences, unwanted content, literacy, archiving the internet, notions that refer to a media understanding of the internet, and that gives different answers um, and different policy issues. Third metaphor, internet as culture, uh, where focus is on some of the norms and values, the cultural practices that unfold online, some of the specifics of the, of the practices of sharing, for instance, of creativity. And again, direction is pointed towards how do we promote access to knowledge? How do you benefit creators? How do you draw the line between ownership and sharing? So here we are, it's, it's, different, it's different issues than in the public sphere um, metaphor. And lastly, internet as infrastructure, where the internet is addressed and inspired by ongoing policy debates on how to organize the operation and the governance of the internet's technical layer. Um, 
a, a technical foundation, you could say, for the, other, for the other areas. And where some of the contested issues include the role of private and public parties in maintaining and developing this infrastructure. Who controls it? Who decides on matters of public policy on the infrastructure? So four different takes on the internet. And I'm not saying that it's either one. I'm saying that they coexist and that you can use the framing to unpack specific policy debates and to make clear what are the themes that are being addressed, what is the public-private framing entailed in this specific framing, what is the regulatory model proposed, what is the potential for social change that is sort of implied in that thinking, some of the policy themes, some of the policy controversies, and also some specific human rights issues that relate to each of the four framings. So, infrastructure, the internet governance debate, we have two of the old timers, uh, Wolfgang and Jeanette here. Um, one issue, human rights protection vis-a-vis -vis a private US-based corporation. That's not a public sphere uh, debate, that's an infrastructural debate. The public sphere, access to the internet, protection of online freedoms within that sphere. Media, content regulation versus freedom of expression. Is it okay to remove content on the internet that is not illegal by national law? Most freedom of expression people would say no. Yet it is happening all over Europe because it's being framed in a different type of discourse uh, with referring to private parties, decency, liability. And another topic, uh, right to privacy versus standards of publicness uh, within the media. This is, this is referring, um, it's a debate we've had a lot in Denmark with regard to the Internet Archive and which elements of the Internet is okay to archive. Um, where many of the media scholars would argue that when something is on the internet, it is published. Is something published when it's on the internet? Hmm. I don't know. Something is published. Some, some stuff people would consider published. Other stuff, they would just consider that they were having conversations. And they didn't necessarily see these conversations being archived for ages and ages. So that's, I mean, that's... And that's an example of a tension of a debate that's, that's going on right now in relation to the internet framed as a media. Finally, with culture, the old classic one uh, that Lawrence Lessig has called the most important cultural battle, um, cultural political battle of our time, um, sharing, um, sharing of knowledge versus ownership of knowledge. Uh, and we also have protection of privacy in, in these online public spaces as, in a, as another issue. I mean, there are many, many more. It's just to give you some, some examples. Okay. Um, then, what I do more uh, in my research is that I point to some, or rather in, at the end of the research, I point to some cross-cutting issues, some cross-cutting human rights challenges. There are three of them uh, that I'll just uh, end with. Um, yeah, this is just to stress that I don't see the metaphors. It's not like that. They may, I mean, I'm sure there are more metaphors, and I'm sure they coexist in any given setting. So it's more to sort of clarify what's at stake, which actors are promoting which themes within which framework. Three current challenges that I'll point to. One I've called double standards in policy making. By this, I refer to the fact that. For instance, when, when Frank LaRue's report was presented at the UN Human Rights Council last summer, um, I think it was the Swedish, I think it was the Swedish Prime Minister supported by 40 states uh, that, that had this supportive statement of how important it was with freedom of expression on the internet. And you can find many of these standards. And precisely because human rights are so very general, it's easy for governments easy, yeah, quote unquote, for governments to agree on that freedom of expression prevail on the internet when you state it at that level. But at the same time that statements like that are being made, just a few months later we had the whole ACTA debate in Europe. I mean, ACTA is still unresolved. ACTA also touches upon 
freedom of expression. We have tons of debates on various mechanisms of content regulation within EU countries. The Nordic countries are very bad. I mean, it started with child pornography, but it has moved on to other areas. It's a huge debate. And there's really some contradiction between this sort of of, um, general appraisal of freedom of expression, especially when it happens in, uh, during the Arab Spring, etc., and then policy making that we do at home. The other one I've called privatized law enforcement, and that's referring to another European tendency, um, uh, the notion of self-regulation that's so popular. Uh, within Europe, and the reason that I'm concerned with this is, for instance, in, uh, in relation to, to blocking and filtering that I was just talking about, that you, that you provide um, internet uh, service providers with means of taking down content without, uh, with no judicial control, so decisions are taken administratively by private companies. And even a lot of the companies themselves oppose this. At the Stockholm meeting in, in November, we had a debate on this, and many of the telecoms said that they don't like it either. They don't like the role that they are being assigned to play uh, in the data retention regime. It's problematic. It's not, they don't see it as part of their business model to retain citizen uh, data uh, on a general level. And the, the third challenge I've called public commercial life. And by this, I'm referring to this specific asset of the digital world that public life largely unfolds within a commercial realm. Public life, where we meet, where we talk, where we debate, where we exchange, where we network, take place within spaces where these actions, these essentials of public life, life have a commercial value and are being used for commercial purposes. And that proposes some human rights challenges that are fundamentally different from the ones that we had uh, in the offline world. Two final slides, then we can go to the discussion. These controversies, um, these controversies that I've sketched out, they occur at many levels. Some of them are related to controversies between the level of state intervention, state versus market. We have that, for instance, with the infrastructure internet governance debate. Some of them is restrictions in freedoms where it's states versus the individual, data retention, for instance. Some of them is related to the commercial and public character of various services on the net. Then we have the rule of law versus self-regulation that are two completely different systems that sort of are being brought together in these years. And we have public sharing practices, de facto practices of public sharing versus regimes of ownership over information that we had for many, many years and that we widely try to bring on uh, to the digital world. Why are these issues difficult to solve? Why are we discussing the same issues year after year? Well, some of them represent fundamental political disagreement. In some of them, there is a very asymmetrical power relation involved. Some of them, in some of them, very different systems of communications try to interact. For instance, rule of law versus um, the role that are ascribed to private companies. And then largely many of these issues are negotiated uh, below the public radar and are slipped in through many different pieces of legislation without a general public debate um, at national level. So some of the, the uh, proposals that I have for things that we could do to, to advance the agenda would be one thing would be as also was mentioned earlier today is that uh, as much as you have a right holder you have a duty bearer i mean that's sort of fundamental in in human rights um, law so it would be interesting to map the duty bearers across the different dimensions of internet use to make it more clear if we have a right to freedom of expression online across these different dimensions who who carries the duty? Who carries the duty? And if it's not the state, how is the duty then secured and grounded with that particular party? There's the human rights by design uh, that I hear. 
IT companies increasingly uh, speak to. That should also be at policy level, so that when new policy is proposed, um, the human rights um, framework is, is mainstream to a much larger extent than it is today. Then there's public awareness raising, not least amongst youth. Um, it's important that these issues are included in the human rights monitoring mechanisms. There are all these mechanisms that have been going on for 60 years and are involve, evolving all the time. It's important that is, these issues are brought in. And I think probably the, the Freedom of Expression report uh, addressed at the UN Human Rights Council this summer was the first time that there was a session that so specifically focused on internet-related issue and a particular right. And I mean, I, I'm sure that will evolve, but it's, like I said earlier, it's a very slow uh, process and the UN is a very slow system. And then it's important that internet-related issues are included in human rights education and training. And at least the networks, the human rights network that I know of, for instance, the European uh, Masters Programme, that is collaboration between universities across Europe. They, don't, they still don't have specific themes on these issues. So that's another venue where I think it's, it's really important in these educational spaces that the issues are brought together and maybe also the students to some extent. So thank you all.